The point is that this playlist is English for thinking people, thoughtful English, if you will. The idea is that this playlist is for two people. First, people who are learning English but are sick and tired of the same old conversations. What did you have for breakfast? What did you do on the weekend? Where will you go on the holiday? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite movie? Do you like movies? Oh, let's have some serious conversation. So if you're learning English and you want to listen to English, to learn vocabulary, to improve your listening skills, if you want to talk, comment, and have your comments answered, have your ideas talked about in future episodes, this is the place for you. The second group of people who might be interested in this playlist are English speakers who would like to listen to something interesting because every episode in this playlist will be focused on cultural differences between the continent, Europe, and the English-speaking world the United States primarily, and of course to some extent Great Britain and Australia. And that's why we're starting here with Count uh, de Merode, because there's a huge contrast between Europe and America as far as Count Merode is concerned. In America, we don't have counts, we don't have princes, we don't have kings or queens. In Europe, they do. Now, most Americans are very familiar with the royal family in Great Britain, but actually, many Western European countries have kings, and princes and princesses, they have an active aristocracy. And this is one of the major differences between the United States and the culture of the United States and continental Europe, especially continental Western Europe. I think that this difference is the primary explanation for the first generalization that I would like to offer for discussion. Namely, the generalization that the United States is built from the bottom up while Europe is built from the top down. Now you see, it's not simply a case of the rule of aristocrats versus the rule of the people. It's a deeper cultural difference. Most European aristocrats are likely to be extremely progressive and democratic. This is nothing new. If you look at European history, some of the most radical, revolutionary, progressive Europeans were also aristocrats. Why? Because aristocratic privilege meant that the aristocrats had access to education and had the time to really think over what they were reading. And many of them came to the conclusion that their respective 
social, economic, and political environment, the conditions in which their subjects or populaces lived was faulty or to some degree required change. And so paradoxically in Europe, and again, I am radically generalizing for the sake of discussion. I'm not giving any specific examples because I trust that my audience is adequately educated to recognize that what I am saying has broad application and I am sure that you can come up with your own examples. Of course, some of you will come up with counter examples, that's fine. But again, for the sake of argument and for the sake of opening this discussion, I think it is safe to say that a large part of the progressive, reformist, democratic tendencies in Europe, the Enlightenment itself, not to mention the Renaissance, basically everything that we usually associate with democratizing tendencies came from the top down, not the bottom up, in Europe. And because of this, paradoxically, Europe remains at heart a hierarchical aristocratic political society. Now, I am not saying that people with aristocratic titles hold sway in Europe, certainly not to the extent that was prevalent hundreds of years ago. What I am saying is that there is a cultural habit of accepting top-down rule. So, 1,000 years ago, kings and queens and feudal lords told people what to do and justified it using religion, later using other arguments, ideologies, whether national or progressive. So in the modern era, a new class of aristocrats, usually holding civil service jobs, tells people what to do and justifies it not with religion or the old national or social ideologies, but with new ideologies. And my goal here is not to comment or opine on any of these ideologies. My goal is simply to try to make a point, namely that just as long ago in Europe, the ruling aristocratic classes justified their rule by arguing that they had the divine right of kings and the population by and large made it a habit to listen to their rulers just as later many aristocrats and many of those who enjoyed privilege turned against the old system and began to propagate reform, enlightenment, revolution even, convincing the masses to rebel and standing at the head of 
mass movements which changed Europe dramatically, so in the modern era, quiet armies of civil servants write countless regulations which then filter down to the masses dictating every facet of public life and often private life as well. And again, my goal is not to comment on the content of these regulations, just as you will notice I am not commenting on the content of the dogmas, dictates, or edicts of kings and queens from ages past. My goal is simply to show that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Europe is fundamentally hierarchical, top-down. America, by contrast, because it never had an aristocratic class, and because it was born in rebellion to the attempts to rule it as though it had an aristocratic class, so America is a society built from the bottom up. Now, many times, the ideas, ideologies, religious notions, political ambitions that we see in America and Europe are the same. And again, I am not commenting on their content. But I do think that the notions themselves in America arise from the bottom up whereas in Europe, they arise from the top down. Some Americans may quarrel that ideas originate in the universities, which themselves are semi-elite ivory towers, and these ideas then find their way filtering down through the mass media, through the journals of opinion, through the press, to the people. Well, there is some validity to that notion, but only some. The extent to which uh, that process can actually be called the process which governs America is very limited, especially if we ask the academic elites themselves what they think their impact on social and political life in America is. So I think that you will find that most academics will agree and perhaps even agree with great sadness that their impact is minimal. Alexis de Tocqueville, when traveling America in the 1820s, noted the power of town spirit in America and noted just how much power there was in the small American towns, which echoed ancient Greece, the ancient Greek polis. And in a sense, the entire American Federation arguably was conceived as an attempt to preserve, retain, and nurture 
all of the virtues of the ancient Greek polis within a large empire of liberty. Something which earlier generations of statesmen believed to have been impossible. A combination which was believed to be impractical. Some may argue that modern America proved the skeptics right. But if we compare modern America to countries built on different foundations, one could argue that the American experiment has been a marvelous success. That is also open for discussion. So that's it for our first episode. If you are looking for a conclusion, you won't find one here at the end because the goal was not to communicate an opinion, not to give a conclusion, but to open a discussion. Those of you who are learning English, I hope that this topic is both more interesting and more challenging than what movie did you watch last week and what's your favorite food. I encourage you to listen and read the subtitles. And those of you who are English speakers, thank you for being patient with my somewhat slower pattern of speech. And I hope that you also enjoyed this episode and I invite you to comment uh, maybe you have experience living in the United States or living in Europe. Join the conversation and I'll talk to you next time.